Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I had occasion just a wee while ago, two months ago, to do a little drawing like this. Well, in fact, this very drawing. It's a figure of the figure of Illysus, a drawing of the figure of Illysus, the river god that sits in the jam of the pediment of the Parthenon in Athens. There he lies, that river god, horizontal object that sits right in the corner. This was the river that Socrates crossed when he had the vision that he had offended his demon or his daemon, the god of love. Well, drawing the thing, it's preparation for a big sculpture that I'm going to be making in England. Drawing the thing gave me back the same old thrill, the idea that you're doing something essentially narcotic when you're drawing a thing before you. You give up entirely upon yourself, all your thoughts of your ambitions, your sexual drives, your care about the VAT return, all the rubbish that you've got to deal with in the course of taxi calling and privy filling that make up life's uh, awful karaoke. All this seems to disappear and one goes into a strange trance. Now, of course, doing a drawing like this can nowadays be regarded as somewhat subversive. It's the kind of drawing, in fact, that would get you kicked out of art school. Unless, of course, you drew some rude word across the front of it or disclosed to your tutors that it was drawn in a crayon made of compacted diarrhea essence. Or if you turned it upside down and said that this drawing was somehow subversive. Or if you said that it was counteractive of certain things that were normative. You know, that kind of language. These are all saying things, of course, and, and, and saying is not what I do. I'm an artist that believes that artists should keep their mouths shut. I mean, I, I won't today, just for you. <laughs> Very dangerous when you start talking about art, because sooner or later, you'll find yourself seeing with your ears, and we're not bats. Well, there was a great philosopher in Germany in the 19th century who talked about this question of seeing with your ears. His name was Arthur Schopenhauer, and he's been a fantastic source to me of simple wisdom, but also insight, and he stopped me from being a furious person into being a curious person. It was tremendously helpful because the quelling of rage is something that we all really very much ought to do. He said that the rage of the world he called it de villa, the will, the will to live ultimately, is a terrible thing that drives on and causes all the misery in existence. That all fighting, all shouting, all selfish, egotistical and ignoble things are a direct spawn of the will to live. Rather, he said, we should seek out the great things in the world that defy this will to live. Amongst them, he counts academic endeavour, scientific inquiry. He sees the giving of alms as something that stills the will. He sees the lives of the mystics, the hermits in Upper Egypt that give up everything and mortify the flesh. All these things are done to counteract the imperative, the thundering anvil strike of willing. Most of all, he says, what stills the will most effectively is aesthetic experience and the encountering of art. As I get, get older and, and a bit wiser, I see that this is the great resource in my existence. I've stopped tub thumping, and I've started to draw and sculpt in silence. Now, if you, you've got to watch out if you're going to attain to great wisdom, because you might look like this in youth, and it's a fairly good effect, but after all these years, <laughs> You can see how genius can fairly erode a man's face. Uh, actually, what you're really looking at here is the absence of teeth. You see, teeth, no teeth. <laughs> teeth, no teeth. You've got, you've got the idea. Schopenhauer uh, was a tremendous misogynist, of course. And so because of this, people pay no attention to him. But th these comments do him very little credit. The, the problem is that a great, great deal can be derived from his teaching. For me, he was absolutely fundamental in the first works that I made as a monumentalist. He was a great admirer of the great Scottish philosopher David Hume. He, Schopenhauer wanted to make a translation of David Hume's work into German. It was never done. He could never get a, 
a publisher for it. It would have been a great thing if he had, but he said to me, Schopenhauer said to me, across the eons, geez, that's a great thing about history, you don't actually have to be there. He said to me, when you make a statue of a great man, of course he's up, you know, don't dress him in his quotidian clothing, rather show him naked or simply throw a shock of drapery over his shoulder. Because of course, what a philosopher's interested in isn't the nature of your trousers. It's in the nature of the perennial questions that we've been asking for the last 2,500 years of Western culture, at least, and the last 6,000 in the wisdom, the great Vedic wisdom of the Far East. Schopenhauer also pointed out to me that the great philosopher Aristotle had said that life itself is identified primarily in terms of movement. It's true enough. If you see somebody lying on the floor and it's an alarming situation, you will go up to check if you can see a sign of movement. And if you can see them moving, then you know they are living. It's an instantaneous affirmation that there's life there. The problem about statuary, of course, is that it is famously still. No matter what you do, um, you just can't get a reaction out of it. And this is very difficult for statues in this day of obligatory, in fact, government-required inter uh, interactivism. You know, everybody's got to be cluing up with everybody else and exchanging uh, email addresses and all that sort of thing. You see, if you actually take Aristotle's face here, there's nothing I can do to make him pay attention to me. You see, I, can, I take my clothes off, complete no reaction, do a moonwalk, no reaction whatsoever. In the modern times, when movement and life were the thing, never before like this, the statue is in the back foot because he will never join in. This is why in the 20th century, which was in last century, which is an extremely vitalistic and dynamic century, there was a mighty artistic rush towards the movies, film. If you get into film, you've really made it because the films move, and they have colour and action and dialogue. They are dialectical. But statues are stationary for the next thousand years and are never known to utter a single word. They are, in fact, part of a Trappist order. There's very little trouble in Trappist monasteries. It's very hard to crack, you know, pick a fight. So you can see how, how the statue, therefore, stands as a thing in the midst of the torment and whirl of life the Trotskyite perpetual revolution of existence. The statue stands there counteracting that. And as long as it does counteract that, then it's my notion that it's committing a sin against life. This is the great problem that the representational artist makes uh, in general, but the sculptor of representational objects makes in particular because he puts a still thing into the middle of the teeming world. And this is a kind of original sin. He's not taking part. You see, when you look at a monument or a statue of some sort, any artwork, you'll often find yourself, I mean, if you're of a certain disposition, drifting away slightly, taking a, well, look at Roosevelt, you see? Now, he's always on the hustings, and the polio notwithstanding, you can see that there's a certain gobsmacked effect on his face there. You see, this is a man under the voodoo of seeing art, proper art, the strength of the aesthetic experience. You can see that the senator here, well, he's up for votes, so he's smiling away, and the artist himself, well, he's just desperately telling the guy what's on. Now, the question of the idea of the original sin comes back to the very, very start of our Western culture, the culture of the Occident, to which I'm very greatly devoted, even though I think the wisdom of the East is actually, in the end, greater than the wisdom of the West. At the beginning of Western culture, we have this astonishing figure, this dialectical, turbulent figure called Moses. I'm glad to say that the world is not so cynical that the Jews of the world, who, when they visit Rome, is, they, they haven't given up on visiting this statue. And it's a strange, contradictory work to see this image, this graven image of the great starter of it all, whose tablet that he carries there has as its second commandment, thou shalt make no graven images of anything in the air or the land or the sea that exists. 
the idea of the ancient prescription against making representations of the world. Well, we know the story, don't we, from Exodus, when the children of Israel, dragged out of Egypt, are now wandering in the Sinai desert. Moses goes up to the top of Mount Sinai to commune with Jehovah, who's a form of Mother Nature. And he comes back down and finds that the poor children of Israel, now exhausted with constantly traipsing across this God-forsaken desert, have now been relieved of their, their, their governor, their general, and have decided to put down a little foundation. Then they shall make a small structure rising up out of it. Then they shall put a little piece of sculpture on it. You see, it's a molten calf. And then they shall decide to dance round in a circle around it. And they're going nowhere. You see, a circle goes nowhere. These are all symbolic of stopping and dwelling. And then, of course, because they're dancing, they're out of breath, so they've got to shut up, so they can't speak. So the dialectical imperative is gone as well. It seems to me like a wonderful moment of peace and tranquility in the middle of the general tour. Now, you can't see this because of the lighting, but up there, we've got a picture of Moses coming down off the mountain. He's got the brief with him. It's a fairly restrictive brief. And the second article of it says, thou shalt not sculpt. In fury, he gets his Levites, who are his ideological enforcers out, rounds up the 3,000 men, women, and children who have been involved in this naughty behavior, forces them to grind down the calf into a soup, which they must drink in punishment, and then has them all put to death. This in direct contradiction to the sixth commandment, which says, thou shalt not kill. This proves to me that making statuary is worse than murder. <laughs> so, are we terribly naughty people? Those of us who spend our days packing wet mud onto big, sugarly structures. Well, quite stiff structures. This is a statue of James Clark Maxwell in the clay stage. You can see the rough modelling there, and you can see how it gets much finer up there. Well, you know, it's funny that every work I've ever made has always had somebody terribly angry with me. The David Hume statue. David Hume would never have worn a toga, as though I'd made some sort of mistake. <laughs> and there was a statue of Cicero walking about in a shell suit somewhere. And many people, scientist types, you know, when they saw this, they said, why don't, you know the way they speak, why don't you just put up a piece of granite and have the four beautiful equations drawn on it? So no images, please, no words even, no diagrams. Let's go away from all that and have an equation. Well, it's pretty boring. Anyway, I'll be the judge of whether the equations are beautiful or not. Beauty is skin deep. Maybe the equations mean something, but they don't look any good. See, the amazing thing is, making sculpture or making images, having the cheek and insolence to objectivize the world, people don't like to be objectivized, to objectivize the world, is something that we've been doing for an awful long time. This wee image here is tens of thousands of years old. Look at its realism. Look at the modeling round about the haunches of this animal. It, it, we did it, and then we lost the ability to do it until, well, until the, the more modern parts of ancient times. And I think it's very significant, really, that these works were done in caves, because I think the people that painted these pictures weren't doing it with consent. They were doing it in secret, in the bowels of the earth in case the ideologues and furious nature upholders, in, in, in case the Levites of the world should see them and drag them up and, and do away with them. So we have these works. Do you think this is fabulous? I just think, why would you paint something so deep, so far away in a cave? The reason is that you are burrowing in to the nature of the world. You are scrutinizing it. You are eyeballing it. You are telling the world what it looks like. And the world doesn't want to be so informed. You wanted to see what, what uh, Roosevelt was looking at. Yeah? Well, there it is. You see? Can you feel the gorge rise in you? The anger, the hackles rise in your back. When you see a graven image like this, 
possibly the greatest graven image on the face of the planet, which will outlive the species, and at one point will be seen to turn up somewhere near Cologne, owing, owing to the process of tectonic shift, <laughs> wearing down the thickness of a child's finger in the passage of from now to the time of Moses himself. Does it make you feel furious? Is it a red rag to your bull? Or rather, does it make you feel calm? Does it make you feel not existing? Does it give you a sense of what the Hindus call nirvana? Literally, does it snuff out your flame? Depends what kind of fellow you are. I know for me, well, it's not religion that's the opium of the people. It's art like this. And it's not really opium. It's more like something like heroin. It'll be the death of me. Thank you very much.